Newsmaker Sunday with Fox 10's John Hook. Thanks for joining us on Newsmaker Sunday. I want to take you back to the summer of 2015 when I-10, that corridor, and some other locations in the valley were terrorized by what became known as the I-10 freeway shooter case. In fact, to set this up, we're going to talk about this case where it stands with the attorney for Leslie Mary Jr., and I'll introduce him in a moment. But first, I want to take you back to that time to give you a sense. If you remember it well, if you lived here, you certainly do remember it. But this is a piece on what was going on in the valley during the height of these shootings along I-10. Take a look. Pretty scary stuff. On a daily basis, hundreds of thousands of drivers travel this stretch of the I-10 near downtown Phoenix. Many say they feel like sitting ducks after DPS says someone is targeting motorists along this busy stretch of highway. Every day I come in from East Mesa and uh, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, people just trying to commute to work and uh, they shouldn't have to uh, be facing that, that kind of uh, problems. Is in the back of your head when you're driving? Uh, every day, every day. It is scary. It makes me more cautious to, to be in that stretch. And, uh, and for everybody else that they could get hurt or get shot, you know, luckily nobody's been killed as of yet. Some people, like Renee Caldwell, not taking any chances. I live out west, and when I come east, I use the side streets. I don't even use the 10 anymore. It's Haven't for a few days. Now. She's avoiding the 10 altogether. I'm driving a lot with my two granddaughters, so we don't want any problems. And I'm just trying to keep us safe. We should be beyond stupid stuff. You would hope? Yeah, I would hope. I would hope, but I see that we're somebody's uh, playing games, and I choose not to play that game, so I don't use the 10 right, right now. Very scary, very horrible. I, I, I hope they catch the person. Back on the facts. Back on uh, Newsmaker Sunday. I want to introduce our guest, who was the, um, and we'll get into who was arrested for this crime, and you know all about that, Leslie Mary Jr. Uh, his attorney, Jason Lamb, is our guest on Newsmaker Sunday. Good to see you. Good to be here. You've been quite an advocate for this guy, and you, in your heart of hearts, believe in his innocence. You know, I, I've been practicing law for over 20 years now, and um, we certainly got behind Leslie. I, I get behind all my clients, but I wouldn't risk my career, my reputation, if I had any doubt in my mind that he was in any way responsible for any of these freeway shootings. We have vetted this case up and down, left to right. There's no evidence that he was involved whatsoever, John. Let me show you, let me show you the video. We're gonna go to uh, tape number four. This was Leslie Mary Jr., what we call the perp walk in our uh, business perpetrator. This is when he was brought into the Fourth Avenue jail. Uh, I guess this was, let's see, I'm trying to jog my memory here. He was arrested in? September of 2015, yeah, Friday night. That's right, I remember the Friday night. Since you've talked to him, um, can you share with us what he was thinking at this moment when he was dragged in? He was completely bewildered. Um, throughout the interview with DPS detectives that lasted a little over an hour, not less than 70 times, he said, I didn't do it in one fashion or another. In fact, he even asked for a polygraph twice. They refused to give it to him. Is that standard to not give someone a polygraph if they ask for it? Polygraphs are, are really tricky. Um, they're not admissible. I they're, they're not but admissible. They can give evidence. investigative uh, agencies a tool. A absolutely. And a common technique is even if someone does pass a polygraph, you can tell them that they didn't to extrapolate more information. Mm -hmm. But most certainly they didn't take Leslie up on his offer. Um, and I think that went a long way when he was demanding the polygraph and protesting his innocence. Let's go back to why he was arrested. Um, this is Courtney Griffin from right around that time, right, right during the arrest. Let's go to tape number three. 21-year-old Leslie Allen Merritt Jr. made his initial appearance in Maricopa County Court this morning where he was read his charges. All right, Mr. Merritt, you are here on the following charges. Four counts of drive-by shooting, which are class two felonies. Four counts of intentional acts of terrorism, which are class two felonies. Four counts of aggravated assault involving a deadly weapon or dangerous instrument, class three felonies. The judge went on listing another 16 felony charges, including criminal damage, endangerment, discharging a firearm within city limits, and disorderly conduct involving a weapon. Mayor Jr. was taken into custody last night after investigators forensically linked him to the weapon used in the first four freeway shootings. During court, the county attorney asked the judge to set a $1 million cash bond. The fear that was instilled in the occupants of those vehicles 
as well as the fear that was instilled in everyone driving on the I-10 in Valley Freeways uh, for several weeks was of such an intense nature and the, that if this suspect is uh, released or uh, uh, such a million dollar cash bond is not put in place, the, the threat to com the community uh, must be preserved. All I have to say is that I'm the wrong guy. I tried telling the detective that. My gun's been in the pawn shop for the last two months. I haven't even had access to a weapon. He went on to say he cannot afford the $1 million cash bond. I could never afford that bond, though. All right, I got step kids, the, you know. If you'll step to the clerk, she'll give you your paperwork. The judge says if he does meet the bond requirement, he could not return to the scene of the alleged crime, cannot contact any of the alleged victims or witnesses, and is not allowed to possess weapons. In Phoenix, Courtney Griffin, Fox 10 News. That was then, and this is now. Leslie Merritt Jr. is a free man. The charges against him, uh, he was charged in four of the crimes, the freeway shootings. There were 11. Uh, he was, the charges were dropped with prejudice, meaning they could be refiled at a future time. Is that, is that the case? Back up. Yes. The charges were dismissed without prejudice, which means that the county attorney can refile with him. Oh, without prejudice. Yeah, pardon, yeah. pardon me. Yeah, I misspoke. Jason Lamb is the attorney for Leslie Merritt Jr. He... The ballistics, it really came down to that. At least that's the part that we covered extensively. There were ballistics tests on, on the ordinance found in these cars that were involved. The state at one point said they matched his gun. Um, but you guys said no, inconclusive. And then you brought in your own experts. They came to the same conclusion, right? John, the only evidence they had against Leslie was a theory that the four bullets or bullet fragments from the shootings mm -hmm. came from the same gun to a 100 percent certainty. Now it's important to point out that within the world of tool mark science, which is what this is known as, you can't make a 100 percent match. But putting that aside for the minute, their theory was essentially A equals B equals C equals D. But for D, that fourth shooting, Leslie's gun was already in the pawn shop for as many as four or five hours. So if A equals B equals C equals D and D is false, so too then are A, B, and C. And that was the only thing they had against him. The ballistics in this, Jason, um, we've heard differing things. You say that the ballistics absolutely don't match his gun. What we're, where we're at right now with the experts is some ambiguity. Would that be fair to say? Some say, well, we can't say it's for sure from his gun. We can't say for sure it's not. I would beg to differ on that analysis okay. because the DPS crime lab said it was a match, but an internationally regarded expert, Lucian Haig, Lucian right. Haig, right. hired by the county attorney's office as an expert, he said, no, it's not a match. DPS is wrong. In fact, something else we learned just last summer is that Luke Haig contacted another expert, John Murdoch in California. Right. I don't know if he was a mentor or a colleague, but Murdoch is very well regarded. He had the same conclusion as Hagen, and actually went even a little bit further to condemn DPS's work. But he affirmed the fact it was not a match. Not a match. Not a match. Not just inconclusive, but not a match. Well, I, I think we need to talk about scientifically. He did say it was inconclusive. But when we're dealing with a criminal justice system and you're proving someone guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, it's either a match or it's not. Leslie doesn't have to prove innocence. Right. The bottom line is this particular type of gun was really incapable of making reproducible markings. In other words, consistent markings on test-fired bullets. It's a so cheap gun. It's a very cheap gun. You can buy it at a local sporting goods store for about $120. Mm -hmm. Do you believe, you do, that the shooter is still out there? Well, it's not Leslie Merritt Jr., so of course the shooter is still out there. But there's no question in our mind, and I put it out there no less than dozens of times. Leslie Merritt Jr., he didn't commit these shootings. How was he doing now? I mean, he was, he was a landscape, um, he worked on landscape crews, sure. right? I think he laid tile, didn't he? I seem to remember seeing video of him laying tile. Um, or... He did a little bit of everything within the landscape world. Um, you know, I, I said to you earlier when we chatted, he's a good kid. He's a hard worker, but it's a really tough ordeal. I'm, I'm not a psychologist, but it's pretty clear that he's got PTSD. I mean, you're locked up in a six by ten cell in solitary no less for, for two, sev seven months mm -hmm. 222 days so does he have a hard time absolutely is he haunted by the nightmare of this sure 
Do people recognize him? Absolutely. Some are, some are really supportive. Some are not so supportive. Mm -hmm. And he just wants to be one of these guys that's the backbone of society, go to work, take care of his kids. His life will never be the same again, and, and certainly not for the better. And there is, there is a, um, you have filed um, a lawsuit against state officials alleging false arrest, false imprison imprisonment, malicious prosecution, negligence, mm -hmm. uh, intentional infliction of emotional distress. Where does that all stand right now? Well, civil cases take a lot longer to go through the court system uh, as compared to criminal cases. That one is an active litigation. Uh, I'm not going to say a whole lot because it's just not appropriate to do so. It will work itself out within, within the courts, but we're on track. Uh, it, it's a civil lawsuit, uh, and it may take some time to work out, but again, we, we stand behind Leslie. Jason, if cops got it wrong, if DPS got it wrong, Leslie Mary Jr. could end up a very wealthy man. Is that safe to say? Well, it's not necessarily, John, about wealth. It's about what's fair and what's right to compensate him for what he's been through and what he's going to continue to go through for a long time. Uh, we, we don't look at this as Powerball or anything like that, but I think most important as a first step is some acknowledgement uh, of wrongdoing. Take responsibility for the mistake that was made. You're talking about DPS, County Attorney's Office. Absolutely. Why have they, with what you've told us, why have they not backed off their path that they've been going down, that he's the guy? I mean, charges have been dropped um, with prejudice, right? Without, Without. prejudice, um, meaning they can be refiled. Correct. Why have they not backed off if the evidence is as clear as you say it is? That would be a great question for county and, and state officials. I don't know. Uh, is it a matter of pride? Is it a matter of ego or even arrogance? That's not for me to answer. All I know is that the evidence that the state produced in the course of the criminal case pointed to Leslie's innocence all the way. And in fact, we came up with even more evidence, uh, work that they didn't do, evidence that they didn't look at or know about, that further affirms the innocence. When we come back on Newsmaker Sunday with Jason Lamb, the attorney for Leslie Merritt Jr., the one-time accused freeway shooting, we're going to get into that, that discussion about what they didn't do in this investigation. Back in a minute on Newsmaker Sunday as we review the freeway shooter case, still at this point unsolved. Welcome back to Newsmaker Sunday. We're talking about the freeway shooter case back in the summer of 2015. Uh, the, the freeway, mainly the I-10 corridor, w was terrorized by somebody shooting at motorists. Nobody was killed, fortunately, but there were 11 incidents. Eventually, a guy by the name of Leslie Mara Jr. was arrested. He was brought in, held in jail for seven months, charged with this crime, at least four of them. And now, Leslie Mara Jr. is back at his landscaping job, and the charges have been filed without prejudice, meaning they can be filed again. His attorney, Jason Lamb, is kind enough to join us this week on Newsmaker Sunday. I want to show a piece. This, this gets into a little bit of the interrogation that happened with your client. This is tape number six. This was after his arrest and then when he was fighting to prove his innocence with your help. Take a look. I have videotape from the freeway with your silver car. I have ballistic test that comes back yeah, to you your gun. Yeah, you shooting my gun out of my Absolutely. car? Absolutely. Bullshit. Absolutely. I have not fired my gun, dude. That's bullshit. bullshit. Investigators tried to get Leslie Mara Jr. to admit to four of the I-10 freeway shootings. They claim to have video evidence but ADOT doesn't even record what their cameras capture. The truth is I have not shot my f***ing gun in at least two months, man. That's the truth. Tell me a good reason why your gun would be ballistically analyzed. All I can say is there's some kind of mix of and there has to be because I have not shot my gun in two months. But investigators press on, saying they have scientific proof, claiming they have an admission from his girlfriend. Why would your own wife even go and tell us, yeah, I think he did it? Why would she I even tell she us that? that? No, I'm telling you, she said that. During the interrogation of Merritt's girlfriend, investigators threatened her with a possible terrorism charge. Domestic terrorism charge. Yeah. Okay? That's what you're looking at. Okay, that kind of includes the whole family. Okay? If you have knowledge of what's going on, I strongly suggest that you tell us right now. I don't know what's going on. You know, Jason Lamb, the attorney for uh, the one-time accused freeway shooter, is our guest on Newsmaker Sunday.
There was a lot of discussion about his telephone, where it was, that it wasn't with him at the time of the shootings, it was in his home in the West Valley. Is that accurate? That's yeah, and to, and to clarify on that point, um, DPS brought in some extra resources. In this case, it was the FBI. And there was an agent, and all he does is cellular phone analysis. And they were able to map the GPS coordinates of Leslie's phone at the time of these particular incidents. Um, the first shootings, the first two, were Saturday, August 29th, right around 11 a.m. Well, the phone was up at his home in Glendale. Saturday night, the 29th, uh, his phone was yet again in Glendale at his home. Sunday night really didn't matter because the gun was in the pawn shop. But if we go back to Saturday morning and we focus on these first two shootings, 11.03 and 11.05 a.m. on the I-10, Leslie was talking to his grandmother. We have her as a witness. And he also had left a message for his grandfather in Florida. And by the way, his aunt, who happened to be there at the time, heard the message. And this was all confirmed. In fact, at our initial bail hearing, I believe in November of 2015, we even flew in these witnesses. And I've met with these people several times. They are very, very solid citizens and straight shooters. So an alibi was created with the state's own evidence. Is the prosecution alleging a second phone? No, they're not alleging that. They're alleging that all our witnesses are liars. They've got nothing better. Jason, when people hear this, you know, the, the reasonable reaction would be, they'd say, why does the state continue to pursue this guy if, if what you say is true? Well, it, it is true, and, and we've been very transparent about what our evidence is. All the court pleadings uh, are now out there in the open for the public to see. Um, there's no disputing w what's irrefutable that's out there. Why this continue, John? I, I really don't know. That's not a question for me to answer. How is he doing in the wake of all this? I mean, you said he, he's rattled, but he's back at his job. Has he been able to kind of get a semblance of life back? He got rehired. That was... He, he did, but he actually lost that job at some point um, due to a staffing issue. It wasn't any misconduct on his part, and it's really hard for him to get a job. Uh, there's a... What there... happens when a employer starts to do a little research on Leslie Merritt? Well, it's happened several times. Thank you very much for your application. We'll be in touch. And the phone never rings. There's a stigma, an aura, that attaches to Leslie, even though he was, you know, uh, the, the beneficiary of that dismissal. Not even a beneficiary. That's a bad choice of words. The charges were dismissed because he didn't do it. But it's something that's going to haunt him for the rest of his life. What do you want now? What would be the legal remedy that would be appropriate? Let's take the civil case out of it, which would be damages and money, potentially. Well, at some point, you know, it's not so much a legal remedy, but, you know, an acknowledgement that he's not the guy. You know, we want the community to be safe, but the reality is that the freeway shooter is still out there, and serial killers go dormant for years. Mm -hmm. If you ask me, I don't think we've heard the last of this. I think the Valley is still in jeopardy of the I-10 freeway shooter, the real one. It's not your job to come up with a theory or pinpoint who it may have been, mm -hmm. but do you have a theory? We did uncover some evidence in our investigation uh, that we were willing to share, uh, but that was rebuffed. So we have some ideas, and I know that law enforcement uh, is continuing to work on this, so they say. Um, I, I just hope that it's toward... Continuing to work toward Hopefully. pointing at your client or trying to work on it toward maybe looking at other alternatives? Well, they say there's an ongoing investigation. And perhaps that's a threat towards Mr. Merritt, and that's fine because he, he's not responsible for any of these shootings. But in my heart of hearts, as an attorney, as a member of the community, I really hope they're doing the right thing and looking for the real freeway shooter, putting aside the ego, putting aside the pride. Let's keep the community safe. Is it possible that they are balking at dropping the charges because of the threat of the civil litigation that hangs over them? and the potential award that could be huge. Well, the charges are dropped at this point. You know, could it be bluster uh, and, and just simply puffing because of the civil suit? Again, it's a great question for state officials to answer. But we are very confident, not just in the evidence, but the lack of evidence against Leslie Merritt Jr. He didn't commit these shootings. They have seven years with the statute of limitations to refile these mm -hmm. charges. That's a huge cloud to be hanging over your client. It is, and that adds... How do you handle that? Well, How that do you add, deal with that? That adds to the emotional distress that he's dealing with when prosecutors and law enforcement say the investi investigation's ongoing, when the man knows that he didn't do anything, when we all know that he didn't do anything. It only compounds the emotional harm. But, you know, they say that the truth will set you free, and in Les's case, it has set him free, and we know it will continue to. Uh, I'm going to... 
putting myself in peril here and every reporter in, this, in the city, <laughs> how much did we convict this guy in the media? I think that he was initially crucified, um, but I think one of the things that my co-counsel Ulysses Farragut and I did, we got out in front of this. Um, just like he was publicly uh, accused, I think he was uh, publicly freed. And when people started to see the evidence, uh, they realized, and I think there's been a, a big swing of the pendulum. Is everyone convinced? Probably not. But I, I think there's a natural, visceral reaction on the part, frankly, you know, uh, of the media uh, and law enforcement that we want to keep the community safe and we want to get some consolation. Unfortunately, there was a rush to judgment. I only wish that law enforcement embraced, you know, the same open mind that the media did on this and realizing, you know, that Les wasn't responsible. Jason Lamb, the attorney for the once accused freeway shooter, Leslie Mary Jr., is our guest on Newsmaker Sunday. Back with some final thoughts about this case that still is technically unsolved. Back in a minute on Newsmaker Sunday. Back on Newsmaker Sunday, Jason Lamb is my guest. He is the attorney for Leslie Merritt Jr., the once accused freeway shooter. I have to uh, show you the video. This is when the new report came out, Danielle Miller, in May of last year when the charges were finally dropped. They're a small piece of evidence that's cast a huge